Today is Monday, December 8th, 2008, and we are conducting an oral history interview at the Brooklyn Navy Yard with Howard Zinn. Um, and I'll just start with, please tell me what... Okay. Uh, tell me where and when you were born. Yeah, I was born in, in Brooklyn, 1922. Mm -hmm. um, what is your family background? Yeah, my my parents were immigrants from Europe. My mother came from. Uh, they're both sort of Jewish working class people. Came here. Uh, my my father came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, probably the part that's now Poland. My mother came from Siberia, from the city of Irkutsk, uh, and they came here and worked as. Uh, uh, they were factory workers in New York. They met as factory workers and got married, and then they moved to Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, that's where I was born. Okay. Uh, where in Brooklyn? I was born in actually a sort of what was then called, I guess, part of Williamsburg, but I don't know what they'd call it now, Dean, sort of uh, Floyd Street, mm -hmm. uh, which was near Stockton Street and not far from DeKalb Avenue and <laughs> I'm just rattling off some yeah, of the streets okay. that were nearby to get an idea. Uh -huh. Yeah. Floyd and Stockton aren't familiar to me but of course yeah. DeKalb is just up there. Yeah. Um, when did you come to the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Yeah, well, I, um, it was in 1940. I was 18. Uh, f f young people were desperate for jobs. Uh, in my background, my neighborhood, uh, my situation, kids didn't go to college at the age of 18. They went to work. And so uh, I took a test. They announced there was a civil service test to become an apprentice in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, like, I don't know how many thousands of young people took that test. I think, I think 30,000 young people took the test for 400 jobs and 400 guys who got 100 on the test got the jobs. And so I was one of those 400. So I was one of 400 uh, young people who then went to work as apprentices uh, in the Navy Yard and, and in 1940. Okay. Um, which which area did you work in? I became an apprentice ship fitter. We all were assigned rather arbitrarily. Uh, you know, some became ship fitters, some became joiners. A joiner, I learned, I had no idea what a joiner was. A joiner, I learned, you know, worked with wood, uh, ship shipwrights, machinists. Um, and pattern makers who were more white collar people worked with blueprints. Uh, so, yeah, the, the uh, apprentices were uh, divided along these different specialties. And so I soon found myself working as an apprentice ship fitter with uh, a real ship fitter, <laughs> uh, a senior ship fitter. Uh, and, you know, we had a little team of the the ship fitter, his apprentice, me, and then working with us and around us, uh, a welder, a riveter, uh, a burner, a chipper. I soon learned what all of these people did. You know, the the the, sh uh, the ship fitter had the job of fitting the steel plates of the hull uh, together in the right way. <laughs> uh, like a kid working on a jigsaw puzzle, uh, working with blueprints and and uh, and the, the the rigger the was the person who uh, worked the huge cranes that lifted these metal plates into place, and so the rigger would lift the metal plates into the right place, and the ship fitter would decide where it belongs and move it this way or that way according to the blueprint, and and then call in um, the, the well first do some tack welds. And that's what some of the apprentices did also. A tack weld was a sort of temporary little uh, 
inch of a weld to keep the, the plate in place until the welder came along and did the real weld, or if not the welder, the riveter came along. Uh, the riveter uh, was working on things which made it actually more secure than a welder. A weld, a weld could be broken more easily than something that was riveted. So the welder, the riveter, and we thought the burner was somebody with an acetylene torch who would cut the steel plate down to size. And the chipper was another person who, using a compressed air hammer, would make a tremendous noise, an enormously powerful tool, because it had to drive a chisel into the steel and cut off edges of the steel. And generally, uh, generally the people who who were the chippers and the riveters who did the heaviest, toughest work. Because the riveting machine was a huge, not like these little riveting machines you see in <laughs> doing, or not like the ones that worked on sheet metal. The riveting machines, which had to put rivets into these thick steel plates, required a very powerful person to hold on to this huge riveting machine. And as he used it, you know, his body would vibrate with the riveting machine. And the guys who, who were the riveters and the chippers were usually blacks who were hired to do the toughest jobs in, in the yard. What would you wear? What was your <laughs> uniform? <laughs> my my <laughs> uniform, I like that word, <laughs> uniform. We wore very, well in the winter we wore very warm clothes, layers of clothing. I wore, we had uh, steel-tipped shoes, mm -hmm. uh, because there were all these metal things falling on our toes. We used steel ship to shoes and and uh, warm double layers, you know, you know, winter underwear, double layers of clothes and uh, hats uh, with ear muff hats that went over our ears and heavy gloves, and uh, because we were working out on the waves, and uh, it's working out on this um, long, inclined surface on which we built the hull of the ship so that when the sh ship was built, not totally built, but built enough so that they then work on the, on the, uh, you know, the decks of the ships with, uh, but when the, after the hull was built, and a ship was going to be launched, it would be launched, it would slide down the ways into the water. So the ways were out there on the, on the river, really, and the cold wind blowing in from the river. So it was very, very cold. And we would, in order to keep warm, we would huddle around the, the riveter's fire. Because the river had a little fire on which he heated his rivets before with his clamps, where he put the heated rivet into the rivet hole, so then when the heated rivet cooled, uh, it, of course, then fastened mm -hmm. the plates. But we, we uh, went around the riveter's fire in order to keep warm, or we went into the head to keep warm. The head meaning, you know, the head is the toilet, <laughs> so, uh, one of our favorite places. Nice. And, uh, uh, and then in the summer, <laughs> it was very hot. Very, very hot, um, because we were wearing protective clothing, and and, and uh, I remember that they gave us salt pills in the summertime, uh, to uh, because the, the, we were sweating, sweating, and uh, we're sweating not only because of the heat, but because a lot of our job required us to crawl into the hull, into these little compartments which were four by four by four and which had a little hole through which you could go into this four by four by four apartment to work to do a tack weld to check up on whether it was right and and so it was very very hot you sweated a lot and so you had these salt pills to apparently make up for the salt you were using in in all the sweating um, but you know, we spent a lot of time crawling into this, well, what was called the double bottom of the hall, because uh, we, when I went to work there, we, they were just starting to build the USS Iowa. Starting to build meant starting with the keel. And 
Now, when I see think of a keel today, I think of a, something in a sailboat that, you know, which is a protrusion down into the water. But what they called a keel in, in the building of the Iowa and the building of the battleships was not that. They called the, the very bottom of the ship, the double bottom of the battleship, they called that the keel. And that's what we started working on. And the keel uh, consisted of all these compartments, and the idea being that when, if one compartment got flooded, it would be confined to that compartment, and so you wouldn't be flooding the entire double bottom uh, of the ship. Um, the keeling is a ceremony uh, often, right? Were you, at, the, were what, you at any ceremonies? No, I, no, no, no. I did not attend did any, any keel. Launching? No, I, I, no. I, uh, this, I don't know why. <laughs> we weren't invited to the, no. to the, to the ceremonies, no. Um, but uh, when we finished, I knew that there was a ceremony for the launching of the Iowa, but I wasn't there. Because then the next thing we did after the Iowa was launched, started building the Missouri, which was a ship that you know became famous as the ship that the surrender was signed by the Japanese and the U.S. at the end of World War II. I worked on the Missouri just for a while, uh, and actually then, come to think of it, I also worked on, for a while, on building uh, LSTs, which were landing ship tanks. Yeah. <laughs> they were strange little ships that, you know, they looked rather flimsy, though they were made of steel, but they they were just big enough to hold one tank, and they were going to be used in D-Day to have, you know, thousands of LSTs bring tanks onto the beaches of Normandy. Um, so we built, we built a number of those, uh, and, and, and then at a certain point in uh, early 1943, I, I stopped working in the yard because I enlisted in the Air Force. I actually, I could have stayed because we were, you know, we considered important uh, war workers and we were exempt from the draft. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to go. <laughs> wanted to fight in the great war and all of, against fascism and all of that. So I enlisted in the Air Force and that's when I left the yard. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, okay. um... Did you work with any women if you left in early there were, 43? There were no women working out on the ways. There were women who worked in uh, sort of office capacities, administrative jobs, but I didn't, I never saw any woman working. And of course, there were thousands of people working. I mean, working on the, on the battleship Iowa was an enormous operation. The battleship Iowa. When you, if you stood it on end, which was almost as tall as the Empire State Building, this is a sort of a, a, a. This always astounded me when I thought of it, that it was as long as the Empire State Building was tall. So it was a huge, huge place. Thousands of people worked on it, but I never saw a woman working on it. And maybe there were women later who worked, maybe not out on the ways, or maybe not as ship fitters, but. Maybe the women worked as machinists. I heard that in uh, 1944, uh, which was after I was gone, there were women machinists, but I didn't know any women. In fact, we had an, an, a, there were no women apprentices because we had an apprentice association, which was another aspect of my life in the Navy Yard, and which actually to me was the most interesting aspect of my life in the Navy Yard. Uh, the most uninteresting was work. <laughs> the most uninteresting and the, the hardest and the toughest. I must say this, that when I first, the first day I walked into the Navy Yard, it was uh, an amazing experience because I had never walked into a situation. The first time I walked out on the ways, uh, I was walking into a kind of nightmare 
of sounds, noise, and smells. The smells of working on a ship are amazing. The smells, the smells of the welding, especially when they were welding galvanized steel. I don't know if you've ever smelled galvanized steel burning, but when you, because galvanized steel is covered with zinc, and you, when zinc burns, it gives off the worst smell in the world. <laughs> so that and other smells, and the the noise of the riveting and the chipping, and it was uh, just yeah, it was nightmarish. Something I had to get used to. And so, work was was not very often. We wore earplugs because of. The sound was so horrendous, and uh, uh, and so yeah, work work was not a satisfying experience. It was not not like you know here I was building a beautiful little ship. You know, <laughs> yeah, these people who have hobbies of building boats and whoa, what a nice experience it is putting the little things together. No, this was not a pleasant experience. I didn't even know what the whole thing would look like when it was. Over, I was just working on a little part of this big steel ship, and it, uh, yeah, it, no, it wasn't terribly satisfying. Um, and uh, but this, what was satisfying was um, finding the other apprentices, the other shipfitter apprentices, the other apprentices in the other uh, areas, uh, the, the machinists and the shipwrights. Uh, and the, the joiners and, uh, and and getting together with them and forming a, an association because the apprentices were not permitted to join the unions. That time, the the unions in the ship in the navy yard were part of the AFL, American Federation of Labor. American Federation of Labor was a federation of craft unions. Uh, craft unions meant that the unions were divided by skills. And so the, uh, the unions in the Navy Yard were all separate, the machinists' union and the shipwrights' union and the joiners' union and the boilermakers' union and the shipfitters' union. These were all separate unions, the craft unions. And, and you had to be... Uh, a sort of accepted and experienced shipfitter or shipwright in order to join the union, which meant there was no room in the union for apprentices, for helpers, and there were helpers, by the way, blacks were helpers. There were no blacks in the actual unions. Uh, blacks were helpers, uh, which meant they were chippers or rivers, and apprentices uh, were not in the union. Uh, now, the reason that in the 1930s the CIO came into being is that they came into being because there were so many workers in the country who were not organized because they were not admitted into the AFL craft unions. There were a huge number of unskilled workers, and uh, which included women and black people in the auto industry and so on, uh, who were not in the union. So the CIO had this enormous reservoir of unskilled workers that they organized into unions. And of course the CIO became the militant uh, labor union in the 1930s that uh, was really the heart of the new uh, angry, striking labor movement at that time. Well, we, we, well there was actually a, a CIO union that tried to move in and organize in the Navy Yard, but they didn't get very far. They, they were called, in fact, I was a member, which means I was a member of a very tiny and weak organization. I was a member of, of something with, with the very poetic name of UMSWA, the Industrial Union of Marine and Shipbuilding Workers of America. And I think part of the reason they didn't have any members is that nobody could pronounce that. You see. So, but we, the apprentices, decided we had to organize. We were, I was getting what was it, $14 a week. 
which <laughs> after deductions, it was something like, oh, $12 and something. And I would give $10 to my mother and father and keep $2 <laughs> of spending money for myself. But, so we're getting $14 a week, and we decided, you know, we, we needed to um, get more money and, you know, be organized and be able to bargain with, with the Navy Yard for, you know, certain conditions. And, and so uh, we organized this apprentice association, and I was one of the, the, the initial organizers. The initial organizers were a little group of young radicals, I must say, I must confess, a little group of young radicals who uh, decided we would organize the apprentices, and we did. And so we formed this apprentice association of, you know, 300, 400 apprentices, uh, and uh, uh, and the, those, that little organizing group that initiated it, you know, and there was me and there was a guy uh, who was a machinist and there was another guy who was a shipwright and there was another guy who was a sheet metal worker. And uh, four of us would meet once a week outside of work and uh, talk about organizing and also we would read books and discuss these books, radical books. Uh, <laughs> like what? Political books. Oh, well, we would read uh, Upton Sinclair, Jack London, mm -hmm. and Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, we'd read and discuss, and yes, we were um, the organizers. And I, my job was uh, activities director. Uh, of which I had a huge amount of experience. Mm -hmm. That is zero. <laughs> uh, activities director. I, my job was to plan activities that would raise funds for the association. So, uh, actually, I was I was part of two activities that we engaged in because I also organized a basketball team, and I was one of the members of the basketball team. Not because I organized it, because but because I was a fairly good basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I, I, I was six foot two. I think now I'm five foot two. No, I'm 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 not. I'm just a little less. But at that time, I was six foot two. At that time, you didn't have to put seven. You didn't have to be seven feet tall to be a basketball player. Six foot two was okay. So I, I organized a basketball team, and we. And we formed a, a, an apprentice basketball team, and we played basketball teams that were formed by the other, the unions, the older people who were in, older meant they were in their 30s or 40s, and they were in the, the carpenters, and we won, hands down. We were the youngest, we were the fastest, we, we, won, the, we won the championship, the, we were the Brooklyn Navy Yard champion basketball team. And the other thing of that, that I organized was a moonlight sale and uh, to raise money. <laughs> a moonlight sale on the Hudson River. Oh. Hudson River was as close as we could get to the Riviera. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, and it was on that moonlight sale that I had my first date with my future wife. Oh, so, uh, how did you organize the sale? Well, organizing the sale meant just, uh, you know, get, writing to all the relatives of the, you know, just notifying the not, the apprentice was notifying the other people in the yard and and uh, uh, yeah, writing, getting names and addresses and sending out letters. We, we didn't have email or fax mm -hmm. machines or anything mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, we used old-fashioned ways and, and uh, rented this boat and it was a beautiful moonlight sail. Yeah. 
with organizing the apprentices, did you have any mentors in the union? Did you have any older figures no. who were no. helping you, no. guiding we, you? No. no, we didn't. We we were on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but a couple of us, I said we we've, we've four young radicals, and, and, a, and a couple of us had actually been sort of active in our neighborhoods before that, uh, politically active, and you know. Uh, had your parents, were your parents part of any unions? My parents? Yeah. Did, mm. Was there a family tradition of oh. organizing, or? No. No? No. What ex no, my, my parents were not uh, political people. Mm -hmm. they, they were not radicals. They were just <laughs> very <laughs> ordinary, you might say, mm -hmm. um, uh, working class uh, uh, people. Uh, and uh, uh, but my father was my father was a waiter. That is, he moved up in rank from being a factory worker to being a waiter. And uh, and as a waiter, he was a member of the waiters' union, local two of the waiters' union, which was a Brooklyn local that specialized in Jewish weddings. <laughs> and bar mitzvahs, <laughs> and uh, so that that was yeah. Uh, so he was a, he was a union member, and there was some vague connection between his union and some bunch of gangsters who extorted money from people in the union in order to get them jobs. <laughs> and you know, just you know, part of the the history of unionism. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going through my list very naturally without my having to ask questions, but I do want to know, uh, if you were living in Williamsburg, how did you come into work every day? Were you walking? Did you ride a bicycle? Did you well, my, the trolley? My, uh, my family got uh, a place in the Fort Greene housing project. Uh, which gave preference to people who worked in a navy yard, mm -hmm. and because my family had lived in you know miserable, <laughs> miserable places in Brooklyn, uh, and going moving into a housing project was a real step upward. You know that these these were uh, clean places that didn't have vermin and rats, and <laughs> and, uh, and so they. They were very desirable. Well, these low-income housing projects, which today very often have a sort of bad reputation, they're run down and they're dirty, and this is what I hear. I haven't been in them lately. But when those housing, low-income housing projects were built, they were, they were so desirable. That all these people living in terrible tenements in Brooklyn uh, were vying for these places in these housing projects. And so my family, my mother and father, were very happy to be able to move into the Fort Greene housing project. And when they did that, I could walk mm -hmm. from the project uh, to the Navy yacht. And every morning, uh, my mother would prepare my lunch. <laughs> I carried one of these little metal lunch containers, and it had you know, room in it for a thermos of hot coffee, and which my mother put milk and sugar, and it was sort of the all morning. I was only thinking of lunchtime <laughs> while working all morning. You know, this happens a lot. I think with people who work, they, they are looking forward to lunchtime. They're looking forward to leaving <laughs> leaving work. There's something they look forward to because they're not looking forward to the next hour of work. <laughs> and so, uh, so I so my mother always prepared a very nice sandwich for me. Usually, it was a fried egg sandwich, my favorite sandwich. Mm -hmm. so I, and, and a, a banana, and this thermos of real hot, delicious coffee. So uh, <laughs> I carried my little lunch pail with me, and and uh, and we began to work long hours. Uh, That's when I first got into the navy yard. We were working an eight-hour day, but soon we were asked to work ten hours and soon 12 hours. And 
First it was a five-day week, and then it was a six-day week. And then we were asked to work seven days. And actually we were, we were glad to work long hours. I and mean, we were asked to do it as a patriotic duty, which in a, I guess partly was uh, helpful in getting us to agree to work those long hours. Oh, yeah. This, you know, they need these ships, you know, the, the boys are over there fighting and et cetera, et cetera. So part of it was this, this feeling, yeah, we're doing something patriotic. The other, and maybe the more important part for us, was that by working overtime, we were getting time and a half. And that $14 expanded into 25 and $30 by working those extra hours. So we were making good money uh, by working those extra hours. But it also meant... Uh, there was nothing else in our lives but work. Mm -hmm. um, was your pay going up too? Was your pay rate going up too? As the pay well? rate went up. Yeah, the pay rate went up gradually over those several years that I, I worked there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I don't remember ever bringing home a paycheck more than thirty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. But that was that was really good. And family really needed it, because uh, the depression in the depression, and the depression was still going on, you know, and uh, really, uh, although it, you know, began to ease as, as the war went on. But um, during the depression, the waiters uh, did not have as much work. Uh, <laughs> people made less weddings or less expensive weddings. People still got married, but they didn't have it. You know, weddings with a lot of waiters and so on, so uh, so the family needed needed the money. So I, I you know I became you might say the, the chief uh, you know wage earner in the family, and so in a certain sense by joining the Air Force, I was uh, depriving my family mm -hmm. of that. Except that I even though I wasn't making much money in the Air Force, I would send a good part since the Air Force was feeding me, <laughs> clothing me, giving me a place to sleep. And so I was able to give a good part of my Air Force money, uh, send it home every month uh, to my parents. Your parents got to stay in the Fort Greene housing? They did, yeah. You had been their connection to live there. That's if right. There was preference but they leave. still were able to stay. They weren't evicted from there because I left the yard. Okay. Yeah. Um, did any of your co-workers, did any of your fellow apprentices also leave to go serve, or did they stay the, on? Some of them stayed, uh -huh. some of them left. The more politically aware, the, the little group that I was in, were, as I said, they were the political radicals. And because they were more politically aware, they were more attuned to, oh, uh, this is a war against fascism, you know, and so the the other three guys who are part of our little four person uh, collective, you might say, the other three guys also went into the service. They all went in after I did, but yeah, uh, yeah, they all the th all three of them went into the navy. Uh -huh. I don't know, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it's because the navy was able to use their navy yard skills, whereas. Um, well, no, I, I volunteered for the Air Force, and uh, and so yeah, the three of them went into the Navy. I was in the Air Force, and we we communicated with one another for a while. And after the war, I I would see them occasionally. Uh, that's what I was going to ask next: is um, are, do you stay in touch with any of them today? Would there be? Uh, I lost touch with them. There was one of them that I made contact with uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, they might all be dead. Oh. <laughs> and I say that because most of the, most of the people uh, who are my contemporaries are dead. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> I am a, a rare survivor. Um, so I, I don't know what's, what's happened to them, yeah.
Okay, well maybe I could take some names too later and try and find people. I mean, because we are still looking to I could give you some interviews. names. Okay, that yeah. would be great. Um, let's see, so we talked about what you had for lunch. Is that all you ate? It was a fried egg sandwich and a banana for that whole long day? You're a six foot two guy. Did you snack too? <laughs> you must have. Um, there was there was a little PX uh -huh. okay. where we could get sort of candy and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. and that was about it. Yeah, but that was, yeah, that was the only meal I had while working. Mm -hmm. so. okay. um, who was your supervisor? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed away from the supervisor as much as possible. <laughs> um, a supervisor would occasionally occasionally come around. We didn't have a lot of supervision. The supervisor would occasionally come around, and, you know, and sometimes he would go to the head. I think he spent a lot of time inspecting the head, mm -hmm. see who was there. He was spending too much time in the head. Okay. Um, but, no, I didn't have, you know, my immediate contact was with my, my the ship fitter. The ship fitter was usually some, some body who was from Scotland or Germany, from some country where, where there was a tradition of, of shipbuilding and, and where you know, people learned these skills. And, and so the, there were these immigrants from Scotland and Germany, uh, Holland, places that, that, were, you know, that had ports and had long historic traditions of shipbuilding. Um, that was going to be my next question. Was uh, how do you how would you describe the um, racial or cultural mix? Yeah, well, the as I said, you know, all all white people mm -hmm. uh, had the major jobs, and the, the reg, they were the regular you know, ship fitters and shipwrights and so on and. And the blacks were the uh, rivers and the chippers, really. No women. There were no women uh, workers. And, um, okay. And then the German or the or the Scotch, the your the ship fitter. What was it like working with? Did he have a heavy accent usually, or I mean, <laughs> well, how my, did he communicate? Yeah, my yeah my ship fitter. Yeah. My guy had a heavy German accent. Mm. I suspected him of being a Nazi. <laughs> At least he behaved like a he behaved like a Nazi. How? He behaved well, very arrogant. Mm. In fact, in general, the apprentices were treated uh, with a certain amount of humiliation. In fact, we were called apprentice boys. We, yeah, we, we treated like yeah, very. Arrogant, you know. They were the they were the ones who knew their trade, knew the craft. And they were teaching us, and we were the stupid ones. And mm -hmm. and then, you know, and so yeah, there was a lot of that. Um, yeah, there may have been some kindly, <laughs> uh, gentle uh, <laughs> workers, uh, but I never ran into them. Uh -huh. And none of the guys I knew ran into them. Everybody complained about the way they were treated. Uh, there's this hierarchy. And I think the AFL Union sort of encouraged that hierarchy. We're the skilled workers who belong to the union. You know, these are the unwashed, mm -hmm. <laughs> unskilled uh, interlopers, you know. Were your fellow apprentices all mostly from the neighborhood, too, or...? No, they came from all over the city. Uh-huh. Because the the, uh, the civil service test was you know a citywide test, so yeah, they came from all, from the Bronx and from Manhattan, Queens. So then you would socialize with your fellow apprentices, ever with a ship fitter or or. Well, we socialized. Skills. We socialized after work in in these uh, you know events that we would uh, create, you know, that we would organize with. It was a dance or a moonlight sale or the basketball games. You know, those were the times when we would get together outside of work. Would you get together to go to dinner or would you go to 
would you go to any bars or would you go? No, I'd like to. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to imagine us as tough guys, mm -hmm. leaving the yard, going to bars and drinking. But no, no, <laughs> no. I, no I, I think every. You know, most of these guys were in the same position that I was. They had f mothers and fathers waiting for them at home. You know, and 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 I, going to a restaurant for dinner was something. We didn't even think about. Okay. Um, there's Sand Street outside of the yard, the infamous Sand Street. It's got quite a reputation for during uh, during World War II being a popular spot for gambling, bars, bar brawling, prostitution. It's kind of <laughs> like the blue light district. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we heard of Sand Street. We yeah. knew we knew about it. But we, did, we actually didn't have time to go there. Maybe if we had time, we would have had that experience. Uh, but no, it was, uh, yeah. yeah and, okay. and maybe some of the, uh, some of the older uh, people in, in the shipyard went there. They don't have money. Uh, <laughs> had the money to go yeah. there. Uh, but no, we, we knew about it, but that's all. Mm -hmm. um. Do you have any particularly vivid memories or colorful memories, or does there is there any people who really stand out? Like, what would you say? I mean, your your experiences with the Apprentice Association was the most your most powerful. Yeah, the experience. yeah the experience with Apprentice Association was the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. Getting together with other young people and organizing and planning. You know, our strategies and our putting together our grievances, putting out a little, you know, newsletter of some sort. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the other experiences were, you know, on the job uh, and not good ones, like seeing people injured, seeing people fall into, you know, off a, very often you have to, you walked along <laughs> steel girders, uh, and below you was, you know, a big gap, and there were people who fell and were badly injured. And then there was the one time I remember the worst thing I saw was uh, was somebody directing the the crane operator, and uh, and the, the the crane operator was also operating these huge steel doors. Uh, and, uh, and this, this was not on the ship, but this was in a building outside uh, where they were keeping a lot of the, a lot of the uh, steel plates. And, uh, and there was a guy who was directing the crane operator, and as he was directing the crane operator, he uh, was walking backward didn't see where he's, and he's walking right in between the doors as the doors were closing, and they closed on him. These huge, huge doors closed on him, and the guy who was uh, up there operating the crane didn't see him, and the guy was crushed to death. So that, that was the worst thing I saw. You and saw then, that? You know, there were a lot of other little injuries of guys who looked the wrong at the wrong time, looked at a welder's flash and got, you know, actually I still have a, in one of my eyes a little, a blood, bl one of my eyes a little bloodshot, uh, which goes back to looking too long at a welder's flash, you see. And, and I mean, who knows what other uh, physical effects there were from working in the shipyard because... Um, the zinc actually uh, was deadly, which we didn't know at the time. But years, years later, they found that there were people who worked with that zinc, and I wasn't working with it all the time, just occasionally smelled it and got away from it as fast as I could. But people who worked a lot with that zinc, uh, years later, it was discovered that they developed cancers and died as a result. But, uh, I mean, industrial work is dangerous, uh, unpleasant, and, 
people die earlier. Uh, and I was glad to get out of that. The Air Force was a respite. <laughs> Why did you choose the Air Force? Um, I don't even know. Uh, I had never built a model airplane in my life. <laughs> I wasn't particularly, I think maybe because a friend of mine was, who had gone into the military early, a friend of mine was in the Air Force. And he was writing letters back. It, it, I guess it seemed a little more glamorous <laughs> uh, to be in the Air Force um, than to be in the ground. But that was, I you know, didn't have any strong reason. People didn't generally volunteer for the infantry. Uh, they, you know, when people volunteered, it was for the Navy or the Coast Guard or you know the Marines or the Air Force. And, so somehow I chose the Air Force. Um, to get back to the cultural mix and the ethnic mix of people who you were working with, if the, I mean, blacks were obviously aware that they weren't allowed into the Union. Hmm. Was there, did you talk to, did you talk to many of your coworkers who are African American and find out that they, I mean, what was the sense of that sort of, Separation, the segregation, really. Well, now well, we we talked. To, we talked to the black guys who were uh, rivers and shippers, and you know they just uh, shrug their shoulders. You know that's the way it is. That's the uh, that, that's the you know nothing strange to them. Mm. You know, a number of them came from the south. Uh, they were accustomed to segregation, and well, of course, and even. Black people in the North were accustomed to segregation. Mm -hmm. You know, the neighborhoods we lived in in Brooklyn were segregated. The black people lived under the L, lived under the Myrtle Avenue L. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a Myrtle Avenue L anymore, but mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any L's anymore in, in Brooklyn. But, Maybe. yeah, but. A couple you, stops. Yeah, the L, you know, the elevated line and under the elevated line, the people who lived in the, in the, in the, tenements that were right under the L, they lived in darkness all the time. There was no sun that came in through the L, and that's where black people lived. And then, and they moved out of there, they didn't move out of their places, I mean, they left uh, their living place during the day to go to work in the white neighborhood. So they work as janitors or whatever menial jobs in the white neighborhoods, it was very much like Johannesburg, South Africa, which, you know, many, many years later I visited and you see the blacks lived in their little black uh, shanty towns and come into Johannesburg to work during the day and then go back to their little black townships at night. And that's the way it was in, in, in Brooklyn. So on the yard, were any of these guys talking about organizing, or or was it just such an accepted fact of life that they wouldn't be able to get into oh, the, the union? the black guys talk about organizing? Mm -hmm. I never heard, no. Well, of course, it was very hard for them. They were separated, you know, by, in the, I mean, of course, we were separated too, the apprentices, but uh, no, they, uh, no, they didn't talk about it, and uh, I didn't see any moves that they made to organize. Mm. Um, yeah, we, I told you we had interviewed another gentleman, African American, who was here as a machinist at 44 to 46, and he talks. He worked at the yard twice in the in the 40s, and then later on in the 50s during mm. the Korean War. Um, and he said that in the 40s, he remembers having C and W badges. Do you remember anything like that, like C as in colored and W as in white, that he remembers that there were badges no, no, that said C no, and W? No, I don't remember no. badges, no. Okay. He, re he recalls badges that they mm -hmm. wore, C mm -hmm. and W, really? Yeah. Mm. But you no, don't, I don't recall remember anything that. like that? Okay. No. So it was an integrated somewhat environment, but not in terms of the unions. That's right. Okay. Um, And then we talked a little bit about the climate in terms of people, meaning they, they, 
the skilled laborers mm-hmm. or the skilled yeah. workers yeah. having yeah. a greater yeah. sense of arrogance and yeah. and ownership of the place. Um, any anything else along those lines? Any sort of personalities that represent the yard at that time to you in your like a uh, I guess was there a greater sense of camaraderie too because of what you were working on and like well, yeah the camaraderie was was not so much at the work site uh-huh. but uh, afterwards in, in the in the apprentice association uh-huh. there was a camaraderie uh, outside of work uh, And I, okay, and a sense of like the ships that you were working on. So you knew what you were contributing to, of course. Yeah. And we've talked yeah. about that yeah. too. Um, I feel like, unless there's anything else that you think we might have missed or that you want to volunteer, or I don't know if you have any final thoughts, I'm really done with my questions. No, no, those are all good questions. And, you know, okay. yeah, I think I've covered the experience. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Sure. I really appreciate your time and your clear yeah. memory. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this documentary. <sighs> That's a wonderful experience, the people who we're getting to meet and the experiences yeah, that we are collecting. You're doing just what we were talking about last night at the Studs Turkle Memorial, oral history. Yeah, it's great. And uh, so I hope you'll send me the finished movie. I will indeed. Well, we're not sure if it's going to work into a movie right now. Oh, okay. We want to we want to produce an orientation film for the center. Yeah, well, whatever. But it might also be um, we might incorporate the interviews into the actual exhibit itself, have small yeah. screens where people can yeah. just get a snapshot. Yeah. So, we'll see. We're, right now the most important thing is just getting everything, right. just collecting, and then yeah. we'll figure out how to tell the story. <laughs> okay. Once we have everything collected, so um, I don't. That's that's it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs>